kujikunia Ara So I'm really thrilled and uh, a little bit, actually a lot intimidated to introduce a very distinguished speaker, Professor Stephen Harnad, uh, who holds uh, the Canada Research Chair in Cognitive Science at the University of Quebec at Montréal. Also a professor of Computer Science at the University of Southampton, adjunct professor of Psychology here at McGill, and Professor Harnad is in many ways one of the giants of, uh, of Cognitive Science, right? So he's done some groundbreaking work in the area. Sorry, I, I have to interrupt. Yeah, please. Sure. I'm not a giant. I'm a <laughs> well, you sure, sure, but you've had some pretty impressive interlocutors like Searle and, and, and Dennett. Searle's a pigment too, and so is Dennett. <laughs> <laughs> sure, 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 sure. But but you you've at least gotten a pretty infamous shout out in the you know in Dennett's. Uh, Philosophical lexicon, if you might tell people a little bit about sure. that. Sure. Right, right, right. Uh, so, so, uh, so Steve here um, has his very own entry in, in uh, Daniel Dennett's infamous philosophical lexicon, and, and I'm going to quote here. So, in the idiom, to get a harnad, to be seized with insatiable appetite for academic uh, miscegenation with voyeuristic, exhibitionistic, and sadomasochistic features, <laughs> usually requiring the possession of an intact, bilaterally symmetric organ of dissemination, the harnads, right? <laughs> Capable of uh, emitting an unrelenting steam of uh, BBS. <laughs> BBS is Behavioral Brain Science, is the journal. And BS, I think you know. Yeah. <laughs> right, 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 right. Are you still the editor of the BBS? No. Uh, I, as a matter of fact, I gave it up, and I'm now editor of Animal Sentience. Okay, cool, 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 excellent. Okay, so I, I, I suppose it's really complex, but maybe at the heart of, and correct me if I'm wrong, your, your disagreement with Dennett, and to a different extent with Searle, is uh, your take on the so-called heart problem, right? A hard problem which for some reason that I personally unsophisticatingly fail to comprehend has become fashionable to claim that there is no such thing as a hard problem. And I think because people don't want to be camped as some sort of species of dualist or panpsychic or vitalist or transcendentalist or whatever. But, but there are some of us who claim or who hold, however, that we have a little bit of a problem. And we've talked about it um, a little bit in this class. So very briefly, because I, I don't want to steal the show, I think sometimes it might be worth it to revisit Leibniz's old windmill experiment, right? So Leibniz in the late 1600s uh, said, well, you know, what if we were able to build a, a machine that could think and feel, and the machine was as big as a windmill, and say you were able to enter that machine, well, all you would find would be machinery. You would find no thought or no feelings. You would certainly not have access to the machine's feelings. So I think if we fast forward to now, the current state of, of neuroscience, we basically have the same problem, right? We find uh, so-called neural signatures that we may want to correlate with thought or with feelings or, or with sentience, but we're not finding the thing itself. And we may find some correlation, but we're not finding causation. So some people hold that there still is a problem. But at the same time, you're also making some very important provocative claims and arguments about the need to recognize sentience not just in one another, not just, so we're not just zombies, but, but in, in all sentient beings. Right? So that's it. But without further ado, I'm very pleased to give the floor uh, to Steve Harnad for a talk on. Well, no, actually, I'm not sure. This is just another version of it. I'm not sure I'm going to use any of these um, transparencies at all. Um, I have a number of people from my course here, and uh, that's an advantage and a disadvantage. Uh, the big difference between this seminar and anything you heard in the, in the course is that in the course, I had to um, basically put the emphasis on the scientific and the philosophical uh, aspects of this, and here I'm free to put the emphasis on what I think really matters the most, in fact, the only thing that matters. The only thing that matters, not just for this problem, but for anything. Okay. And that's going to be the emphasis. So I, I will touch on the hard problem, because it's, it, uh, it, it enters into the, the, um, the discourse. But this is not a talk on the hard problem. How, just a show of hands, how many people, I'll do it reading by reading, 
How many people read the um, Quetzi article? Okay. How many people read the Fuentes article? Well, that's pretty good. How many people read um, Why I'm Not a Carnivore? Uh, and the other two articles. Uh, uh, okay, so fine. So, so I, we could start the discussion right now. But, but just just for those who who, um, who haven't read it and who might want to see it here in context, my students are also used to the fact that I prefer discourse at the level of kids sit and not at the level of academic uh, toby stuff. So I'm going to talk baby talk as much as I can over here. Uh, when I talk about consciousness, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to use any of the synonyms, like the, the, the weasel words, but I'm also going to put a, of, of the many choices of words that you could use, I'm going to put into its place the one that I think is the most honest and the most revealing. And Sam mentioned it, which is feeling. You did say thinking and feeling. Mm -hmm. So I, I, um, I'm curious when you said that um, if you, if Leibniz said if you opened it up, you wouldn't find it there. What do you think thinking is? Are you asking if thinking can ever be divorced from feeling? Yeah. Because I'm really not sure, but, but there are degrees, it seems to me, and I don't De really understand them. Degrees of what? So for example, if I, if I recall an embarrassment, I can feel it again. If I recall breaking my arm, I can't really quite feel it. Or if I project myself into a very hypothetical situation, I'm not certain that I can consciously access to what it is like. When you're recalling your breaking your arm and you can't feel it hurting, mm -hmm. what are you recalling? I mean, what is it that, what's going on in your head? I'm, I'm recalling a sequence of events. That meaning what? I mean, a sequence of events is words, but what, what's going on in your head? Well, I'm, I'm sort of semantically recalling having been hurt, but I can't re-experience the pain symmetrically, the way I could probably experience embarrassment again. Yeah, the, the reason I asked was because I'm never really interested. You could have chosen um, a sunset rather than pain. I'm not really interested in what the feeling is. It's whether you're feeling something when you're thinking. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you again, can you think, can you think without feeling something? So you're right, I yeah, uh, probably can't. Okay, now, it, the, what makes the hard problem hard is the fact that it feels like something to, f to think, not the fact that you think. We, they, well, there would be nothing problematic about saying that computers think. If think simply meant internal processing that generates certain uh, input-output stuff. What makes it a problem is that it feels like something to think. And that applies to Descartes' cogito as well. And in fact, I'm not new to the in my course, but the, the cogito would have been better off calling itself sentio sure. rather than sure. cogito. Sure. Because, sure. Yeah. And moreover, it wouldn't be sentio ergo sum, it would be sentio ergo sentito, which means I'm thinking, therefore thinking is going on. I can be sure about that. I can't think, I, I, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm feeling something and therefore feeling mm -hmm. is going on. I can't feel something and say, but I'm not feeling anything. That feeling isn't going on. That's a contradiction. And that's the essence of the cogito. So anyway, this is just to put the, and I use too many um, big words there. This is just to put the emphasis on the word, which I think should be doing the duty over here, which is feeling. Feeling is what's at issue. Feeling is what makes the hard problem hard. And feeling is what makes matter in matter. Um, the reason, the, the, the uh, preferred way of putting the hardness of the hard problem is not some sort of metaphysical question about whether feeling is really um, brain function or not. Of course feeling is brain function. I mean, anybody that thinks it's some other you know, cosmic uh, dust is in Never Never Life. Of course it's brain function. That's not the hard problem. The hard problem is this. We know that brains our brains are responsible, generate causally, you said it was a causal issue, it is a cause, generate everything that we can do. Everything we can do is basically being done by our brains. And if that's all there was, then we do stuff and we have brains. So the stuff we do is uh, we see, we, we, pardon me, see is, is equivocal. We, uh, we detect things optically, uh, we move around. 
we, um, we uh, detect things acoustically. I mean, acoustic um, vibrations on, on our cochleas are, are, pick, are picked up by our brains, and we can act on them. We can run away if it's a loud sound or whatever. Um, and also, when, when we're injured, we can tell when we're injured. But it feels like something. All of those things feel like something. And the hard problem is, why and how do they feel like something? If there was only, if the only problem was find the causal mechanism in the brain that generates your capacity to do everything and anything that you can do, there would be no hard problem. That is, in fact, the easy problem. The hard problem is how and why do we feel? And I'm not going to focus on that over here because it's so easy to send yourself off into Zen koans about, uh, about, um, about uh, the hard problem and not get anywhere. And also, you could, we could also waste very easily at least half the session, more than half the session, on attempted hypotheses to answer this question, how and why do we feel? I mean, the typical one for pain is, well, look, if you didn't feel the pain, you know, um, it would be very maladaptive. You'd, you'd, you'd keep put, putting your hand into the fire. But that's wrong. I, to make this a little bit interactive, I invite anyone, and in particular anyone in my, in my classes, to say why that's not why that's wrong. Why that is not the solution to the how to the how and why we feel pain. Or if you want, support the idea that sure, if you were we know that it's very maladaptive to have this uh, uh, nervous disorder where you don't feel things. I mean that's terrible. So that's why you feel pain. There's not really anything about feeling that necessarily makes people behave, like you need to have some sort of causal um, mechanism that would cause somebody, based off their feelings, to move away from whatever that painful stimulus is. You could still do all those same things without feeling. Right, so I mean, it, it amounts to that. We already have the demonstrations of that. We have robots that can, that, that, that can avoid damage to themselves, uh, pull away, etc., without feeling a thing. The fact that we happen to feel something, you're right, there's a correlation there. The fact that we feel something when somebody hurts us uh, is a fact. That's the, that's the, date, that's the cookie toe, right? But um, how and why we feel something is far from evident. In the course and in the, when, when the street is treated in philosophical circles, you get into the, the, the hardness of the hard problem. But I want to set it aside for a second. Uh, not the way that, that cognitive neuroscientists set it aside, say, we'll get to it when we get to it, or uh, Dan Dennett, for example, said, well, when, at the end of the day, when we explain how your brain generates everything that you can do, and you've got all of the internal correlates of it, I will be able to predict when you're seeing a certain shade of red, because I'll be able to tell from your brain activity. And I'll know that, that when you stimulate that area, you'll say, I'm seeing that red. So I mean, what more causality can you want? You've, you've got the mechanism that generates all, everything that you do. But you haven't answered the hard question. Yeah? I'm just curious where, um, if we're looking in the wrong areas, for how to answer that question, if you have some notion or your own view on what would be a better avenue to look down if we were going to go back I don't, I have, this is just, I could make a distinction in my course, sorry for all of this, but you know what's going to come out. I make a distinction between when I'm speaking about matters of fact or, or things that are taken to be generally true and things that, it's like Simon says, it's when, when I say this, it's just Stephen says it's okay. I say it's insoluble, but that's just me, right? And I have reasons for that, and we can spend a little bit of time. I, I, maybe we can spend a few seconds on the why I think it's insoluble. But that's just what I think. There are other people who say, "Well, eventually, it, even Chalmers, the uh, the baptizer of the term, not the inventor of the problem, of course, but just the one who gave it. Um, he also thinks that uh, eventually it, it, it will be solved somehow. I think he's wrong, and I think he hasn't. In the same way that we haven't got a clue of a clue as to how and why we feel, he hasn't given a clue or of a clue about how, how, uh, how we're going to ever solve that problem. I can't give you one because I don't think it can be solved, but I'll tell you why I don't think it can be solved. There are perfectly good potential answers to that question. 
the one that we all believed before we took too much cognitive science was that, well, you know, feelings are, are a force of nature. I mean, when, I, when I lift up my finger, I lift, lift it up because I feel like it, right? It's a power that I have. You know, I will my finger to go up. Uh, that would have been fine if alongside all the other force, elementary forces of nature, gravity, electromagnetism, the strong atomic force, the weak atomic force, that had also been the force of feeling, there would be no hard problem. It would just be one of those. And we don't ask, why does gravity pull? You know, that's okay. Gravity is a fact. Feeling as a force is a fact. Trouble is that all evidence goes against that. Not only does all evidence go against that, namely, once you have accounted for using the usual four forces, everything that, that all the data that you can that, that there are, once you've accounted for them, there's no uh, degrees of freedom left for force for freedom as a force. And all evidence is that there is no, all these psychic experiments with move, making, you know, your mind moving things, and none of them work. So the hypothesis which would have worked, which would have been an answer, is wrong. That leaves all the rest. The reason I think all the rest won't work is precisely because of the degrees of freedom. Once you have, in fact, accounted for all observable data, once you've accounted for it all, there's no room left for saying, yeah, because so, so this is the mechanism that explains how human beings can talk, walk, each recognize, uh, uh, see, perceive, categorize, remember. I've explained it all, and then you say, okay, fine, but, but, but why is that all felt? There's nothing. There's no, there's no, no explanation. Yes? Is there a way in which, and this is not something that I completely believe in, but a way in which maybe we've already solved the problem experientially because particularly if we get rid of the, the semiotic account of how our shared phenomenal experiences uh, happen through decoding each other's you know signals for each other's emotions i mean we do mediate each other's phenomenal experiences and each other's feelings collectively jointly all the time we do feel each other's pain quite literally not literally that's sure, certainly true. It's not you're not literally feeling, but we do feel something when somebody's feeling a pain, and mm -hmm. it, and it can feel feel pretty bad. We're not feeling their pain. I mean, I, do you, we could talk about that if you mm -hmm. want. I, I, I can. I, throughout these anecdotes came up in in uh, in, in class. I uh, some a famous Tony Marcel who worked on subliminal perception, uh, and who's perhaps manic depressive. He's also <laughs> he's also a um, brilliant Shakespearean actor and brilliant in general. We had a falling out over whether he could feel his uh, partner's orgasm. He said, I can feel her orgasm. Mm -hmm. I said, look, I can give you countless things that you're feeling, but what you're not feeling is her orgasm. Okay? There's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with that. We do have theories of mind. We do have, we can perceive, think we can correctly infer What's, what's going on inside somebody else's head. You can tell, you can, you can see when they're scared. I mean, we're, we're wired. For example, when somebody's about to attack me, and, or say a, a carnivore's about to attack me, I know all the sounds and the, and the, uh, and the, and the, and the facial expressions that mean I'm going to get attacked. But I'm not feeling the feelings of that other entity. I'm simply inferring. So perhaps there's a spectrum of proclivities for interphenomenality in people with near synesthesia have this sort of total access to something that's, that's there. You know, but you see, none of this has anything to do with the heart problem. I said, how and why do we feel? I may have terrific synesthesia, you know. Red may feel like Tuesday for me. That doesn't have to explain how and why I feel. It doesn't. But you mean no experientially? And you not need to ask the question? No. <laughs> No, the, the question isn't an experiential question, it's an ordinary explanatory question. Feeling is clearly a trait of organisms, biological organisms. Biological organisms have lots of uh, properties. They can, they can fly, they can swim, they can, uh, they can uh, talk if they're human beings, and they also can feel, so it's a biological trait. It's perfectly natural to say how and why do they have that trait. There's nothing about my phenomenology that answers that question. All it says is, yeah, we feel. And it feels like this. And that's all. Are you familiar with the arguments claiming that fish don't feel pain? Not only am I unfortunately a f okay, okay. <laughs> 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 well, you just asked me if I'm interested in writing a 
rebuttal with uh, one of your students about that. Oh, good. Uh, Where, uh, in the, the, in the, the article that you're talking about, which is by a guy called um, Key, yeah, yeah. Uh, is uh, going to appear, another version is going to appear in the journal that I'm editing for the, Ameri for the Humane Society of America, Animal Sentience, and he makes an argument for the fact that fish don't feel. We're going to get into that. I mean, that's much closer to what it is that I'm going to talk about mm -hmm. this evening. But insofar as the hard problem is concerned, it's irrelevant. I mean, if it were true that fish were robots, it's false. If, 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 <laughs> if, 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 if uh, fish were um, insens uh, in, insensate robots, then they wouldn't. Then there wouldn't. Then I don't have to explain that biological trait which they lack. I have to explain it where it's present. But it's present in fish too. I, think I always say, because I came here about seven years ago uh, to Canada, and I always say this to people until, uh, maybe until about a year ago, I really didn't understand what it means. And when people talk about feeling, I never had a real on that until about a year ago. That what happened a year ago? Somebody pitched uh, you? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I think uh, I, I had a supervisor who was just ringing me up. And that was when I really began to understand what they were trying to say. So I'm not saying I didn't feel, I guess I did. But to, to you know, I began to understand maybe what they were trying to say. But they could have done it quite easily, and they could have pinched you. And you said, did you feel something? Or better still, they could have pinched you harder and harder until felt, ow. Then they said, well, now you felt it. That's what I mean by feeling. You wouldn't say, what's that? Cogito, the cogito would prevent you from saying, I have no idea what you're talking about. They didn't ask you the right questions. You knew it all along. What, was somebody going to say something? Okay. Um, I want to make a, I want to make a transition here already because I, th I think we should get sucked into the hard problem for uh, three hours. Uh, and the way to, I, I want to personalize it because. Uh, we're going to talk about feeling in another sense now, and uh, it's personal. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's not a, an abstraction. Twenty-seven members of my family were killed during the at the end of the Second World War. I'm from Hungary. Uh, it was part of the Holocaust or Shoah. <coughs> And of course, that, that moves pretty large in my in my mind and in my in my family's mind. And then a couple of years ago, a couple of years ago, I uh, first heard the analogy that was being made between the Holocaust and uh, animal suffering. And my first reaction was, I "Don't say that." I mean, there are there are old. Uh, Holocaust survivors who lost everything, who lost their, 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 I, I survived and my parents survived, so, so these members of my family were a, a little bit further from me, but there were some who had the absolute closest members of their family die, and it's, 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 um, I didn't want to say offensive because I didn't, didn't want to put it on politeness terms, it just seems immoral to make this analogy to them, and yet, and I did, I did change in the, in the last few years. The way you, ch you changed about feeling, I changed about this. I realized, no, it's right. It's absolutely right. The analogy is just right. I, it's easy to say the sense in which it's wrong. Uh, Jews were killed by the Nazis because they were Jews. They wanted to annihilate Jews. That's not why we kill animals. I mean, actually, sometimes it happens. Sometimes we really do want to wipe out animals, but mostly, we kill animals because we like the taste. That's a huge difference. But that's the only difference. Some people say, no, no, there's another big difference which you forgot. They're animals and we're people. Right? Let's stop there for a second. There, some of you will want to underwrite that. What do you think about that distinction? It's not the same when you do this to people, when you do this to animals, because people are people. But a Nazi would have made the same argument. Pardon? A Nazi would have made the same argument about those 
people. They're not really people, right? Uh, yeah, we can take that up. I don't. I think in the end they would admit that they were uh, 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 in the human race. It's just that they're not worthy of being treated as people. I don't think they're saying that they're another uh, species, biological species. No. Right. So it's not the same argument. This is an argument about species. It's that there are some traits. Uh, that set us apart, again, biological traits, that set us apart from all other organisms, yeah. I think like through, throughout philosophy and knowledge history, there has been this anthropocentric tendency in which we see ourselves as superior creatures because we have been able to create culture or whatever. And in education for, well, at least in my education when I went to elementary, middle school, high school, and I think it's something that's prevalent. They teach us that, even though they can teach us that animals feel, they kind of inoculate in our heads that we are something different, that we are superior. And through like all knowledge, I, I don't make them don't agree with that, but I think that's in the mind of almost everybody because that's the way many philosophers and like many like also like the knowledge is structured in that way when they teach us. Well, that's, I, mean, I tend to think of it also as maybe something like, a, like an extremely polarized version of Peter Singer's circle of empathy, where the, the fence is sort of drawn at an arbitrary point, and then you just say beyond that really is not our concern, and whatever's inside, who we are, us, now, now it's us humans, at some other point it's us. My tribe. Yeah, exactly. And so now it's or us. Or my family, ultimately right. my family. Right, or to me. <laughs> but, but yeah. I mean, and I think that, uh, so it's a, it's a sort of a lump, you know, lumping all animals on the other side as opposed to um, differentiating certain degrees so that it's okay to kill a mosquito, but it's, or it's okay to kill, uh, uh, yeah, a mosquito, but it's not okay to kill a kangaroo or whatever. So, so I, I, that's how I think of it. Well, there's no question that the, the degree to which we we, uh, we don't care about what happens to animals uh, varies, and we don't care, we care less about what happens to mosquitoes than to kangaroos. Right. But in what sense, when I say that um, we're different from animals, right? Because I, I mean, there is another distinction. I think uh, Joy Melanie Joy makes a distinction between the animals that we regard as pets and the animals that we regard as food, right? That's another. <coughs> Arbitrary distinction. It's not. It's not because. It's not at all because pigs are less like us than dogs are. In fact, pigs are probably more like us. It's just a, This is the way it's set up. And, I, and by the way, North Koreans uh, and Chinese wouldn't even agree about dogs, right? So um, there's a lot of cultural overload over, over overlay over there. But the underlying continuum isn't degree of empathy. There is a continuum of degree of empathy and, and identification, but it's not the relevant one. And it's not clear that it's a continuum at all. No. It's not clear that it's a continuum at all. I, I'll get to the heart of the matter because I, I, I don't really want to make this into a, a, too much of an abstract debate. Or if, if it turns into a debate, I'd rather it was a debate about the relevant and right things. So I'm going to say what I think. Is this a Stephen Says or not? I guess it's a Stephen Says. So Stephen Says that I would like to be more than a Stephen Says. And, I'm, and it's not only said by me. The Bentham version of what you started out saying, I guess you're all familiar with that, that uh, uh, in, in, in brief, Bentham said, it doesn't, what matters isn't whether animals are smart or can think. What matters is whether they can suffer. And I want to look a little bit more closely at what, it, what this feeling business is. I mean, feelings come in all, well, in, in a variety of flavors or polarities. You know, there's nice feelings, you know, we, we, we tend to say orgasms are on the good side, and agony, you know, uh, excruciating pain is on the negative side. So there seems to be a, a line, a hedonic line from ecstasy to agony. But that's too simple, too. Because if we can agree that the reason feeling matters, really matters, and in fact is the only thing 